And those, those additional pieces of information, it's just like the Holy Spirit grabbing your eye and say, wait a minute, pause here for a second. So we, we are doing that because it's right in line with what we actually already have traced, and that is the promise of salvation through a seed of a woman from the very beginning, the very first prophecy in the Bible. And yet to make that prophecy come true, there's all kinds of things that took place throughout time leading up to the Lord Jesus Christ who is that seed of the woman and the savior of the world. Um, so anyhow, when in this section here, we started looking and, and realizing that uh, the first was uh, Judas had Ferris uh, of Tamar, but down in verse 5 of Matthew chapter 1, it says, And Salmon begot Boaz of Rechab, and we've studied that, and Boaz begot Obed of Ruth. And these mentions of the women, now that's not, it's, Every time it's not going to be a mention of a woman that's going to catch our attention. But, uh, but when, when Judas had uh, Ferris, it mentioned he had it as Thamar, and that was significant. We saw that. And then uh, we, we spent a lot of time looking at uh, Salmon beginning Boaz of, of Rechab, which we think is Rahab of the Old Testament. And then Boaz begot Obed of Ruth. And that's the whole book of the Bible dedicated to that that fact that Obed was, is the son of Boaz and Ruth, and we've already traced it. We just got right to the end last week, so I'm going to read a couple verses out of that because it's going to lead right into the next one. Verse 6 says, And Jesse begot David the, uh, the king, uh, and David the king begot uh, Solomon of her that had been wife of Urias. So actually, in verse 6, you have two. First of all, it just says David the king. It don't just say David. Uh, there's a lot of other people that are going to be listed as a king. Of course, David is the first mentioned as a king. Uh, and and in certainly in doing that, he's bypassing a previous king to David, and that is Saul. And that's, that's significant in, for our study. So we're going to be looking today at the fact of David the king. It's not really a hard study. It's not even probably a real informative study as far as most people know David was the king of Israel, the great king of Israel. Uh, hopefully you even understand how that came about because that's the significance of it. And, uh, and it leads to G Jesus Christ who, as Matthew 1.1 1, 1 started out telling you, the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And uh, the point here is that David the king, the kingly line of the nation of Israel is going to reach down to the Lord Jesus Christ and he is the rightful king of Israel, the only one left in the genealogy that has the right to the throne of David. And Jesus Christ will come back and sit on the throne of David as he had promised. But, uh, so we're going to look at, at that and then later and then after that uh, next week or so uh, we'll talk about uh, Sol uh, Solomon being born of the wife of, that had been the wife of Urias. Um, but anyhow, so just to kind of show those significant points, let's again go back to the book of Ruth. And, and I'm not going to review anything there except that we just ran out of time and we got right to the, the point. We got to the conclusion, but there are some verses there that are just significant to read concerning uh, the three laws in Israel's law that kind of works together for um, the seed line to keep being uh, passed down through Boaz and Ruth, and that is... Ruth is actually a Gentile Moabite until she incorporated, was incorporated into by, by uh, I would imagine, female proselytism, um, but certainly through marriage, uh, that she, she adopted the God of Israel even before she met Boaz, told her mother-in-law Naomi that, she would be, that her God would be her God, her people would be her people, she would die in that land, be buried in that land, and, and, uh, and so she joined herself to the nation of Israel, and, and the law tells the nation of Israel that any Gentile who does that, they're to receive them and treat them with the same rules and laws of, of Israel. Uh, but then she's, she actually joins into the prophetic line, the, the Davidic line of David, in the sense that Boaz, who's a kinsman to her, her father-in-law, uh, actually buys the right to marry her, and we said those three laws, there's, there's a kinsman redeemer that's taught in the law, of someone who's in slavery 
and, ha and doesn't ha possess their own land, how a kinsman can come in and redeem them back from their slavery, back to their heritage. And, uh, and so that's the law of the kinsman redeemer. There's also the Leverite law of marriage that someone who dies, a family member, would marry if there's no... If, if the husband dies and doesn't leave the wife with a, a, a son to inherit, or even a daughter, that, that's later on, that's another law, but uh, to inherit the land, that a family member would marry that, that uh, uh, woman, that widow, and raise up a child, and the first child raised up would continue the genealogy, the inheritance of his father who passed away, or the, 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 the woman's husband who passed away. And then that other one is the, there, there's an interesting law that what if there is no son born? What if there's just a daughter? And what right does she have? Well, the law made a right of inheritance for a, for a daughter who, whose inheritance would be lost if she married into another tribe. And, uh, and, and then her tribe's uh, inheritance would no longer be a part of that, except that there's a law that, that she does, she can inherit her father's inheritance and, uh, and that, that'll become important when we talk about Mary, because it looks like Mary did not have a brother, and yet there's an inheritance that she has through her father that's important for the Lord Jesus Christ and his reign uh, over Israel. But anyhow, the kinsman redeemer part, as we finished in, in Ruth chapter 4, uh, we, we read to the point where there was one other kinsman who was closer than Boaz that could marry Ruth, but when he realized that he can't just get the inheritance without taking the wife and raising up a seed to the former uh, uh, brother, uh, then, then he actually asked Boaz to redeem it for himself. And so Boaz does. And I just pick up in verse 7, Boaz agreed that he would pick up the, the right of the kinsman redeemer, marry Ruth, and, and raise up a child with her. So in verse 7 of Ruth chapter 4 it says, Now this is the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing, for to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and this is a testimony in Israel. Now that's not to be confused with, remember, if, if a man refuses, like if, if Boaz didn't marry Ruth, Ruth could actually take the shoe off of that other kinsman redeemer, spit in his face, and he'd be called the, the man whose house, I always miss that, it's a big long phrase, the house of the man whose shoe was loosed or something like that. And it's an insult because he wouldn't continue the inheritance of his family, uh, of the one who passed away. But here is an exchanging, there, this is actually a legal contract. And so the, the one takes off his shoe and it says in verse 8, Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. And Boaz said unto the elders and to all the people, uh, Ye are witness this day that I have bought all that is Elimelech's and all that is Kylon's and Mylon uh, of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabiteth, the wife of Malon, uh, hath I purchased to my wife to raise up a name of the dead upon the inheritance, and uh, that the name of the dead be not cut off among the brethren from the gate of this place. Ye are witnesses this day. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. And the Lord made the woman that is come, uh, the Lord make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too built the house of Israel. There's a little bit of history in the Old Testament history. The, the very fact that between those two and their handmaidens came all twelve tribes, which too did build the house of Israel. And, and do thou worthily in Ephratah, and be famous in Bethlehem. And let thine house be like the house of Pharis, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, uh, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. And there's that seed line. We said we are tracing the seed of the woman, and there's going to be a, the seed line is going to pass through Boaz and, and Ruth. So Bo Boaz took Ruth, and, he, and she was his wife, and he went in unto her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. And the woman, women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that, the na that the, his name may be famous in Israel. And that is this one who's going to come. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, a nourisher of thine old age. 
for, the, for thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid it on her bosom, and it became nur- and she be- and became nurse to it. And the and the women, her neighbors, gave gave it a name, saying, "There is there is born unto Naomi," and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. And so it shows the significance of the lineage of David, which is going to be the significance of the Redeemer that's going to come, the Lord Jesus Christ, and and the genealogy there, and how God used a a woman Moabite to be a part of the genealogy uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Now that, the whole point of that is to actually show the lineage of David. So there's Obed, who's David's grandfather, Jesse is David's father, and then there's David. So Boaz is his great-grandfather, and and Ruth, the great-grandmother of David. So that brings us to that other part where Boaz begot uh, Obed of, of Ruth, and then there's begot Jacob, and then uh, Jesse, and then Jesse begot David the king, as Matthew says it. And the significance of David's birth is to bring the kingly line in. The, this seed that's coming along is going to be the king. He, he's first, we see him as the redeemer, And in here, when you talk about a kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ takes on human flesh. He's the seed of the woman. Takes on human flesh, so he's a kinsman to mankind. Mankind is in debt with his sin. He can't pay his own debt. But a kinsman, a near kinsman, can come in, and if he's willing, he can pay the debt and free the person that was in bondage. And so Jesus Christ becomes the, this becomes a picture of Jesus Christ being the kinsman redeemer, certainly of Israel, but when you read the book of Hebrews, he's the savior of, uh, of the world as well. And even under the prophetic program, the Gentiles were going to receive salvation. Here's Ruth herself uh, as part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. And he becomes the kinsman redeemer, not just born of the Jews, and, and so he's Jewish, but also he is born into humanity and becomes the savior of all mankind. So that, that's the significance of, of studying the genealogy through Boaz and Ruth. But now we pick up with David, and like I say, this might not be new information to you, but it's certainly real significant information if you're ever going to understand your Bible. Um, you could actually do a Bible survey in one message. If you pick out certain important parts of the Bible, like certainly you, f- you show the fall of the Gentiles in early Genesis. <laughs> I don't want to do this. Because <laughs> I'm just pointing out the fall of the Gentiles in early Genesis, the calling out of Abraham, and then certainly when you get to David, this is very significant because it's going to reach all the way to the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, if you recall when we studied some timing out of, the, out of Acts chapter 13, the Apostle Paul goes through this detail about Israel's history until he comes to David and then jumped right to Jesus Christ. And that just shows you the significance of David the king because the significance of David being the king, it's through David's lineage that Jesus Christ is going to come. Now, let, let's see how that come about. Uh, go with me to 1 Samuel chapter 8. Now we've talked about the judges, and certainly Samuel judged the nation of Israel. But here, here's the situation Israel's in at the end of Samuel's life. It says, chapter 8, verse 1, It came to pass when Samuel was old, and when he had his son, uh, that, his, that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the first one, firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second was Abiah. Ab- Ab- and they were judges in Beersheba, and his sons walked not in the ways in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes, and perverted judgment. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together, and came to Samuel and Ramah, and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy, uh, in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. Now, the thing I I have underlined in my Bible, not only did they ask for a king to judge them, they didn't want Samuel's sons, they were being judged by God would appoint judges over them. And if you recall, you'll see it again even next hour, that when God would raise up a judge, he would not just judge their, he would judge their sins and bring them back 
under the law so that God could bless them. When the judge died, they went back to, to worshiping idols and God had to curse them. Uh, and so he kept been, he's been doing that for 450 years, but now they want a, a king to judge them, not just a judge, but a king like all the nations. Israel wanted to be like the nations. They already got a problem of worshiping the gods of the nations, of the Gentiles. Now they want to have a king like the nations have. And so Samuel's displeased. He prays about it to the Lord. Verse 7 says, And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people and all that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. According to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even unto this day, wherewith they have forsaken me and served other gods, so do they also unto thee. Now therefore hearken unto their voice, howbeit yet protest solemnly unto them, and show them the manner of the king that shall reign over them. So the point is obvious in verse 7 is Israel was a theocracy. And what that means is God reigned over Israel. He might have appointed judges to judge them. Even Moses was judging them uh, in the wilderness and appointed other judges to help him judge the nation of Israel and it became too much for him. But their king was God. And, and now when they want a king like all the other nations, they are actually rejecting God from reigning over them because they want a human king to reign over them. But God actually tells Samuel to go ahead and do it but then tell them what kind of king they're going to get. And if you just read down through this chapter, Samuel starts telling them, yeah, God is going to give you a king, but here's what's going to take place. That king's going to take your sons, and he's going to make them his army. He's going to make them his farmers, and they're going to go out and work for him. He's going to take your daughters, and they're going to be cooks for him. They're going to serve him, and then he's going to tax you. <laughs> you get down to uh, verse 16 there, he'll take uh, your men. No, it's... Oh, there is 15. He will take the tenth of your seed and your vineyards and give unto his officers and his servants. <laughs> we, everybody hates taxing. If you're going to set a king up there, the first thing he's going to do is he put a tax in. They already had a tithe they were to give to the, na to the priesthood for the running of the temple. Now they're going to have to tithe and, and give a tenth of their income to the king. And, and so that, that would certainly cause them to uh, uh, suffer under that king. Uh, verse 18 says, And ye shall cry out in that day, because your king, which ye shall, which ye shall choose, ye, which ye have chosen, which ye have chosen you, and, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, Nay. So here's the prophet of God telling them what God said. They said, No. We will have a king over us, uh, that we may also be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people and rehearsed them in the ears of the Lord. The people said, no, we're not going to believe what God said. We want a king. We want him to judge us. We want him to go out and fight our battles and protect us. You think a king goes out and fight? He does go out and fight battles. He's usually not on the front line. It's their sons that are going to be on their front line fighting the battles, but they're going to actually put their trust, their faith in a king, a human king, rather than God. And if you know anything about it, the time they came out of Egypt, God has always been fighting their battles for them, protecting them from their enemy, strengthening them. And again, that's our we're going to have a different kind of study in the next hour, but that's the things they're going to be looking at. Uh, anyhow, so Israel desired a king, and, and God's going to give them a king. Really, the first time, it's going to be a king that's that's in their liking, after their heart. Um, look at chapter 9. In verse, oh, it's right there. In verse 1, it said, Now there was a man in Beth, uh, in, uh, in Beth, in Benjamin, thank you. I'm trying to get Bethlehem out of this. <laughs> and there was a man in Benjamin whose name was Kish, uh, the son of Abiel, uh, no, Abiel, the son of, and it names all his heritage. Verse uh, 2 says, He had a son whose name was Saul, a choice man and a goodly, and there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upward, he was higher than any man, uh, any of the people. 
So here's this Saul just stands out as you look among the crowds in Israel. He's a head taller than everybody else. And he's not just a skinny little wimp taller. He, he's a stout man. Now they're looking for a man who can judge them and a man that looks like a great warrior that's going to fight. It's interesting, even when Samuel goes to pick him out, he goes hides. He's like a coward. And he calls him out. He eventually anoints anoint Saul to be the king, as God told him that, that he would do. And, uh, and, and so Saul becomes the king in Israel, the first king. But it's the king, it, notice, it's not of the tribe of Judah. He's from uh, Benjamin. And, that he is, uh, and he is the people's choice. And God lets them have their choice in the first man. But then if you come over to chapter 13, 1 Samuel chapter 13. What happens in this chapter is that Saul is to go out and fight the Philistines. And he's afraid to go out and fight, but Samuel was supposed to come to him. Verse 8 it says, And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and a peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering, and it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, uh, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? And Saul said, Because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that thou camest not within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Mishmash, therefore I said, on, I said The Philistines will come down upon me at, to Gilgal, and, and I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, to offer burnt offerings. Now, it's not a king's place to offer a burnt offering. He, by the way, if I would have showed you some other verses there, the Lord, when he appointed Saul, he didn't leave Saul powerless. The Spirit of God came upon Saul and he prophesied. So that God gave Saul the ability that he would need to lead the nation of Israel. God didn't just abandon him. And Saul became not only a king, but he became a prophet. But now he's acting like a priest. There's only one person who God has appointed to be the Christ, the Messiah, the prophet, priest, and king of Israel. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And that, that's, that's why Jesus is the Christ. So when he made this sacrifice here, he's way over his bounds. Samuel understood that. He said Samuel didn't come at the appointed time, but as soon as he was done, Samuel was there. So he just waited ten more minutes or whatever, a half hour, an hour, whatever it took. Samuel was there just late at the appointed, in the appointed day, and, but now it was too late. He offered that. Verse 13 says, And Samuel said unto Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee, but now would the, the Lord have established thy kingdom upon the nation of Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not, not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Now there's a couple things in there. Even way back when, when they first asked for Saul, to be, they wanted a king like all the other nations. Now we're studying the seed of the woman, and that seed of the woman is eventually going to be the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is going to be king. He, humanity, deity and humanity are going to meet in Jesus Christ. He's going to be God, but also a man, who's going to sit on the throne of David. Now, certainly he's not like all the other nations, the king like all the other nations, but he is human in, in the sense that he is going to be born of the woman. And Jesus Christ is going to take on humanity. When I think about that, and I go back, and, and they wanted a king like all the other nations, and God said they rejected me from being king over them. Apparently, the only way I can look at that is that God was never going to give them a human king until Jesus Christ took on humanity and then becomes their king. And... Uh, that apparently that's the way God's will. But even contrary to God's will, when they desire a king and then want a human king, God does give them a human king, Saul. But now he's rejected Saul. He's not going to establish Saul's kingdom forever. That the lineage is not going to be a Benjamite through Saul. But the lineage of the great king that God's going to give Israel is going to come through another man that's called a man after God's own heart. 
One, now, he gave them what they wanted. Now he's going to pick, he's going to choose what he wants. Now, there's one more thing about Saul that I want to point out to you. Come over to chapter 15. And verse 1. It says, Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over the people, over Israel. Now, therefore, hearken thou unto the voice of the Lord, uh, uh, thus saith the Lord of hosts, I, I remembered that which uh, Elimelech did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he was come from Egypt. He was the first king to attack Israel in the wilderness. God said, I, I remembered what he did, now it's time for vengeance. Now go and smite Elimelech, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox, sheep, camel, and ass. I mean, they just wipe them right out. And uh, it's God's judgment. And Saul's supposed to do that. Saul gathers the host together. They go out and, and, and have victory over that, over Elimelech. And it says in verse 7, And Saul smote the, the Amalekites Amal 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 and the Hivites until thou comest to Shur over against Egypt. And he took Agog, king of the Amalekites, Amal alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. And Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the ox, and of the fatling, and the lambs, and all the good that, that would not, uh, all the good, and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse, they, they destroyed utterly. Well, he didn't obey God, did he? And, and he tries to tell Samuel later, when Samuel says, hey, what's this bleeding of, you know, here's the sheep. <laughs> and he says, what's, what's that noise I hear? And he says, oh, I saved these to sacrifice these to the Lord. And, uh, and then Samuel explains to him, uh, down in verse 22, but Samuel said, hath the Lord a great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obedience to the, in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than fat of rams. For, now watch what he relates, what, what Saul just did. It was certainly disobedience. It says, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So when you deliberately disobey God, that's rebellion. And that's equal to witchcraft. Rebellion is the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness, <laughs> your way instead of God's way, is as iniquity and idolatry. You're making yourself God, that's what it's, because it's, that's what it's idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath re also rejected thee from being king. So there's two things that Saul did. The kingdom wasn't going to continue, now his reign is over. God's going to end his reign and bring another king in and Samuel has to go out and appoint that other king that's going to reign over them. Come over to chapter 16. Now Samuel's being guided by the Lord. He goes to the house of Jesse. <laughs> uh, it says in verse uh, uh, 6, And it came to pass when they came that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. So as he goes to the house of Jesse looking for the one that God's going to anoint as king, he sees the oldest son of Jesse, and Samuel's first impression is, whoa, this, man, look at this guy. He, certainly the, the, king, the, the, the anointed of the Lord is right before me. This is the one. But that's not the one. Verse 7 says, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature. Well, that's what they did with Saul, isn't it? Because I have refused him, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Remember, he's looking for a man after his own heart. So as you go down through verse 8 through 11 there, you find out that he keeps going through the seven sons that are in the house of, of uh, Jesse. And, uh, and the Lord says, nope, 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 nope. Finally, Samuel has to say, well, don't, don't you have any other sons? And he says, uh, ver well, verse 11, And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There, there remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send forth and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and withal a beautiful countenance. 
and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is, this is he. And Samuel took a horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose and went to Ramah. So out of the sons of Jesse, the eighth son, I might have told you once before he was the seventh, he's the eighth son of Jesse, the youngest son of Jesse, that's the one God is going to choose and he's going to anoint David to be that king. And so David does become the king in Israel. Now, you've got to come to 2 Samuel for the, all of this. It's chapter 7. So you skip Saul when you read the, the genealogy because Saul, King Saul of the Old Testament, is not part of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. David is the one who's going to uh, be the lineage through which Jesus Christ is going to come. And that makes this 2 Samuel chapter 7 very significant. David had desired to build God a house because God was, the, the presence of God was in a tabernacle, in a tent. And and David, you know, he, he dwells in a house, so he wanted a permanent structure for the tabernacle or for the uh, ark of God to be with the nation of Israel in a temple rather than a tabernacle. But God turns that around on him. He, says, he tells the prophet, verse 8, Now therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep code, from following the sheep, to rule over my people over Israel. And I was with thee whither thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name like unto the name of the great kings that are in the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own, and move no more, neither shall the children of, Israel, of wickedness afflict them any more uh, as before time. Now this prophecy hasn't been fulfilled yet. Because Israel today has been afflicted, they're not even on their land. But he's going to plant them there permanently someday. And since the time that I appointed judges to be over my people Israel and have uh, caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee a house. And it's not going to be a, a physical house that we're talking about here. And when thy days be fulfilled, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and I will set up a seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will, establish my th the, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he had committed iniquity, I will chasten him with the rods of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. David's going to be resurrected to see this. <laughs> Thy throne shall be established forever. So the house of David, the lineage of David, the, the throne that David reigns on in Jerusalem is going to be established forever. The kingdom that's, that David reigns over is going to be established forever. That's a, all that, verse 17 says, according to all these words and according to all the vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. And <laughs> look like Sunday school let out. We have another bell yet. Um, but I, I got the main point there for you, and that is, it's significant, David the king, the king that God recognized, the king that God made a promise. L later on, it's going to say, David's going to make a statement and says about Lord, God's promise, and he says, this is not like a man to make a promise like this. Because he says, well, how do you say that? Something about for a long time to come. Well, forever is a long time to come, is it not? And God's going to establish that seed line of David. He, he took it away from Saul, but never even the, he might have to judge some of the seed line. But he, but when he judges him, he's not going to take a, take the seed line away. Eventually, the the seed of David will come, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, and Israel will be established in the land, the kingdom, the house of David, the throne of David, and the kingdom will be established forever. That's extremely significant for you to understand the Bible. Especially to understand what the gospel of the kingdom is. And that's why it's pointed out there in Matthew chapter 6, uh, 1 verse 6. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you that uh, there's these important parts of the Bible that if we get down, we can understand all the things that are taking place, especially in the earth, earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ and in his second coming. 
as we realize that you're going to bring salvation to this world and now a kingdom into this world and your son shall reign. So Father, I pray that we would understand the kingdom program and even understand the dispensation of grace and the differences between the two as we continue to study our Bible. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.